I'm Paul Dozier. I know most of you. I know a lot of you. I run the Northeast Florida Wahoo Shootout and the Old School Kingfish Shootout. And uh, I, I grew up right here, pretty much, fishing um, for Wahoo and Blue Marlin. We tried to catch Blue Marlin. We didn't catch a whole lot of those, but Woody caught all those, you know, and Mr. Brian over there. But, but um, our boats were, were right down here behind us. And, when I was a kid, and we're talking about in the 90s, and the late 90s, early 2000s, the way you caught wahoo was you trolled big ballyhoo and mullet, maybe a Spanish, if you really got brave, a Spanish mackerel. And as we all know, wahoo fishing has evolved greatly in the last 10, 15 years, and it's turned into mostly, the perception is only a high-speed wahoo fisherman can win tournament to catch big wahoo well i don't think it's true uh, first of all but uh actually the tournament record for the wahoo shootout was held by ryan rodifer and he caught the fish on ballyhoo so i think the uh <clears throat> the key to it is pulling the right stuff at the right speed in the right place so we've got tyler beckford here from teasers bait company tyler's been fishing <clears throat> This is what, your third or fourth month? No, he's been fishing all over the world. He was a mate on the Follow Me, which was a big Viking that traveled the whole world. He owns a bait company. How many, how many Ballyhoo do you sell a year? Uh, half a million. Half a million Ballyhoo a year. Give or take. Probably about <clears throat> half a million mullet a year. Mm, about 150,000 miles. Okay, I'm going to exaggerate. But anyway, Tyler's, <laughs> Tyler's rigged a lot of bait, and he knows how to do it very well. Um, I'll just start off by just going over what I did, which when we had luck, a lot of luck, you know, wahoo fishing with bait. The advantage the high speeders have over the bait guys is they cover so much ground. And back in the good old days, let's just call it, the, the water was cold. The water at the sea buoy was in the high 50s, maybe the mid 50s. I remember one time it got below 50 degrees even. And the weather buoy was out there. They took away, what, four or five years ago. And we'd run out in my dad's birch room. And I remember I'd sit up there in the bridge. It'd be freezing cold. And you'd just wait for that temperature gauge to hit 65, 66. And you just prayed by the time you got to 150 feet, it hit 70 degrees. And if it did, you were going to get them that day. Today, I don't know if the water will ever get below 70 degrees in 100 feet of water. I don't know why. Mitch Rofford doesn't know why. Even if we get a cold winter, it, the, the water is staying warm in shore. So <clears throat> there's Wahoo from 25 miles out to the east side. So you gotta narrow it down to uh, figure out where, where they live. Once you find where they live, I think you got just as good a chance pulling this stuff as you do high speed. But like I said, in, in, the, in the good old days, there was a narrower gap of water, which made it easier to target uh, wahoo on dead bait. I think of what the mistakes a lot of people make in the perception of dead bait fishing is they go too slow. I like to troll <clears throat> as fast as I can to keep the bait in the water. <clears throat> I pull a simple spread, five lines, a shotgun, with a blue and white islander and a ballyhoo, a uh, <clears throat> left long, which would be my longest outrigger just inside the shotgun, with a, a islander and a ballyhoo, a <clears throat> right long, which is a shorter rigger with a cup face lure of some sort that makes a big profile, a planer. I use an a, uh, I don't use an inline planer. I use a planer to the cleat with a number twelve old salty planer with a red and black Hawaiian eye, Islander, and a 48 ounce trolling lead on the left flat with about 30, 40 feet of 150 pound mono with a snap swivel, and then a whatever you want, some sort of bullet face lure. But when we turn them at fish, we use a mackerel on the planer, but we're trolling like I said, as fast as you can, basically to keep this lure, which is a four ounce Islander, 
it's important. There's two ounce islanders and there's heavy islanders that are four ounce islanders to keep the four ounce islander in the water. And I'm fishing on a center console, it's easier on big boats. Um, <clears throat> but you wanna go fast and you've gotta be willing to sacrifice your black fin tunas. You gotta be, you gotta be willing to, to keep your cedar plug or your, your sea witch in the boat. If you wanna catch a big wahoo, I believe that. Because you put that on your shotgun, you're gonna get a bite on that. That's the best lure in the whole wide world. I don't care what anybody says, and I'm not talking about why, I'm talking about anything. A blue and white Hawaiian eye is, is, is deadly. Um, <clears throat> so I think if you can find a narrow down piece of water, you can find out where they're biting. If you go high speeding, you get a bite, and you can work that area, you can put this stuff out and be just as effective, if not more. You know, the Wahoo shootout, a lot of people don't, don't like high speeding for whatever reason. Gas has gotten to be $5 a gallon. Big rods and reels, you leave it in the rod holder. So we're trying to bring some of this back. So <clears throat> Tyler here and Islander Lures has ponied up. We're gonna give away 5,000 bucks for the largest Wahoo caught on a dead bait, a mullet, mackerel, or ballyhoo. No ribbon fish, right? Right. So we're gonna let Tyler, uh, we're gonna let Tyler show you guys how to make a couple rigs here. We're gonna start out with ballyhoo, and we're gonna do a double hook mullet, and then a, a double hook mackerel. Mm -hmm. And so he's gonna do it for the crowd, and then we'll take a break, and then he'll come up here and do some one-on-one, -on -one or you know, some closer up so you guys can see it. Go ahead, buddy. We'll start with, uh, say, 12 wire, 10, nine, 10, 12 wire, whatever, it's fine. Uh, like for the ballyhoo, we'll do a, a 9 0. It's going to be a horse ballyhoo, so it's a pretty good sized ballyhoo. Do a 9 0 regular J hook. Do, um, we're going to make sure that the, for the ballyhoo, we're going to make sure that the hook more or less comes back as far as we can possibly get it in the ballyhoo just to make the hookup ratio better. So, therefore, you need to make sure your haywire is long enough where it's going to be able to put the hook further back in the valley here and not so far up here. So we're going to use a three quarter ounce lead. If it's a bigger valley here or small valley here, the lead might vary on size. Just do your regular haywire here. I, I don't think a lead's necessary all the time. You know, if you want your bait to swim, a lead's certainly going to help. But you know, you can you can catch. You know, some probably on your shotgun line, you don't want a lead on no, there. I'd say, no, especially with but, especially with the uh, with weighted. If you get a four ounce Islander, more or less, you probably don't even need the lead. But for like a regular Islander that doesn't have the lead in it, oh, that, that, one, that, was, that was a heavy that one, one too. Deep. But that's but, all we could find. <laughs> I hadn't been wahoo fishing in about four years, so I had to dig deep in the garage for this stuff, you know? I used fucking light wire in a long time either. You know, I think we've all gone dolphin fishing and, and, and done that and rigging medium ballyhoo, just rigging a ballyhoo. A lot of people talk about bait fishing and I hear it all at the trailer at weigh in. Everybody comes in and says, well, I, I put my baits out and I didn't catch anything. And, and uh, I said, well, what did you pull? And they said, I bought some rig ballyhoo in strike zone yesterday. I said, yeah, I mean, you, you, you're probably not gonna catch a, a wahoo. You're not gonna have good luck. You can catch a wahoo anytime, but you're not gonna catch numbers of wahoo trolling five or six knots with store-bought ballyhoo. It's just not gonna happen. It's just, I think, I think Woody caught, Woody actually was the angler, right? And the, the tournament record here, he caught that thing on a pink and white stubby with a pink bird, 160 feet, right? Like yeah, yeah. But Mr. Bryant caught, caught, used to catch big wahoo here, but uh, you, you guys were always going faster than five or six knots. Or is that, that, that's probably fair to say. <clears throat> so we'll take the, uh, I rigged it with a pin. So take the pin and put it in the mouth of the ballyhoo. You want the pin to be, you know, right at the crease of the top of the mouth. 
and we're going to take the hook and measure it. So right at the bend of the hook, I'll take a, just, and make a mark right here, just so that way you know right where the hook should come out to make it so the hook doesn't bind up or anything with the bally here. Feed it in there. Put the pin back through. And then just piece of copper and nothing too crazy as far as wrapping in it. Just make sure everything stays tight. Keep the lead up there right in the underneath the mouth. Closing the gills up is the main thing. A lot of people use bait springs and, and the, pro the bait springs work, but the problem with the bait spring is a lot of times you get a bite and the bait spring is just going to let go and you're not going to get another chance at that fish. So with the copper, if they come in there and swipe at it or take a, take a slash at it and uh, get, get a piece, you can drop back a little bit and maybe get lucky and, and get another bite out of the fish. And just wrapping it real tight there for their, you know, the main thing is so that the hook's not bound, you know, if the hook stays, if it's real, you know, far out of the ballyhoo, sometimes the ballyhoo will look like that and it'll want to spin. But as long as it's free in the ballyhoo, it's, it'll pull straight and just fine and then just slide the Hawaiian over the top of the, right down the bill of it. And he just broke the back. I don't know if you guys could hear that. He's, he's breaking the back. He's, he's to make it. To, to make, so the, 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 it, it limbers up, so it'll, it'll, uh, Swim, swim properly. Um, I don't think it's necessary to poop the ballyhoos for something in this application with the wahoo fishing. I think it might let the ballyhoo maybe make it a little hardier instead of sitting there rubbing all the scales off it since you're going a little faster. Now, yes, with you know what we're dredge fishing or sail fishing or whatever, definitely poop them and definitely try to get the bladder. Yeah, if you're trolling, if you're trolling. Uh seven and a half to nine knots it's not going to uh that, that that thing's just it's, it's an instinct strike i believe you know I, I i think it's more of an instinct strike and that's why you need to go a little bit faster so yeah and there's plenty of lead underneath the valley here that it should as long as the hook's not bound up it should swim properly I'd, I'd say six, seven foot would be ideal. If you're pulling yeah, a wind on, it can be shorter, but you basically you want to you have a leader that's as long as the fish, and I think that's pretty much in, in any, any kind of fish, and you want your leader to be as long as the fish you want to catch. So if you're, if you're blue marlin fishing, you want to catch a blue marlin that's 20 feet long or whatever, you know, because that thing, when that thing runs, that leader will lay on his back and then get tail whipped. It happens kingfish. You hear everybody all the time say, oh, I got tail whipped on the big one. We lost the big one. Well, that's because they're using a wire leader that long trying to get the bite a lot of times. But the same thing goes for wahoo. So uh, I'd, say, I'd say a seven, you don't want to catch a seven foot wahoo, use a seven foot leader. But bait fishing, you don't want to have a big long leader. I like, to, we use 50 wides, a monofilament, 60 pound mono line, and a bimini straight to my, I don't use a wind on wahoo fishing. So I want my angler to be able to get that, you know, we're, we're fighting the fish and I want to be able to, to I, want to be, I don't want anybody touching that leader because you touch that leader and put pressure on it, that wahoo's sitting there going ta 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 and it'll pull the hook. So, uh, you know, you don't want it too long, but long enough so you get that 100 pounder we all dream about that he, you can hang on to him. Yeah. Do a split tail mullet next. So this is a, it's obviously split tail now. I, I didn't bring any mullets to show a split tail, but we, uh, you know, split tail it, be careful with cutting a tail. We sell them this way, so you don't have to worry about That's doing that. That's the way to split tail a mullet is buying from him. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, again, a nine, 10, 12 wire, whatever. We can use a 9 hook. There's a couple of different ways to do it. This is probably the simplest way as far as you can, you can open up the eye of the hook. You know, we, we do it like use a, some sort of a, a press or a spring plier or something 
open it up, slide the swivel on. The swivel obviously needs to be able to pop over the hook, the barb of the next hook. So it's going to be double hook. And the idea is you can, you can get that swivel just right and, and, you, and it'll pop. Well, usually it'll pop, yeah. So anyway, we're going to use an ounce and a half lead. What, the idea is that is that way the first hook, you can have it up here. The second hook's going to be right there, you know, towards far back as we can get it. Different size hooks for different size mullets. Now while but he's doing that, these, gonna, are, these are kind of smaller hooks, I mean, because he's, he's got them sized up. But a lot of, a lot of these guys, particularly uh, high speed, are using these 80s and 130s even. And if you got 20, or 20 pounds of drag, it could yeah. bend that hook. So you need to be cognizant of what, you're, of what, what kind of rod you need to, even if you can use a big rod and reel, but you got to back that drag off, you know, you don't need 25 pounds of drag to catch a wahoo. Sorry to interrupt you. So the mullets come wedged, so there it's, it makes it easy to slide the wire in down, you know, down through. Sorry. Let's see this first. Um, when they're split tailed, it's split tailed obviously back here, but the first hook's going to go somewhere up this, you know, somewhere in this general area, on the for the fin of the mullet. So, I'll take and measure it where the hook I think is going to be in the general area and I'll just create a little s slice for the first hook. I'll run the hooks in there. The second hook will slide right out. First hook, just as long as it gets up there, somewhere around the gills. Take your wire. Make sure you find the eye of the first hook. That happens a lot where you don't. Definitely check it. It's pointer of the day right there. You know. Slide your ounce and a half lead on. The important part about this, this is to make sure the mullet swims properly is to make sure that the haywire is as tight as you can possibly get it. Creating it so that way the lead is locked in there as tight as it can get right on the chin of the mullet. Take a, take a piece of floss. This is 70 pound floss. You can use 50. I, I prefer 70. It doesn't tear your hands up as bad. We're going to close the gills up and we're going to, when we do that, we're going to close the wedge up as well just to try to make it more, one, so the mullet lasts longer so the water's not running through all the, through the head of the mullet. And then two to tighten everything up to make it swim a little bit better. So we're gonna slide the floss in there, making sure it's real tight. Do two wraps around the for the gills. Tie it off. Then just a simple overhand knot, and then come back and do it again, right? Yep. And then take a rig and needle. Go through the, underneath the, the back side of the lead where the wire is. And we're just gonna make a simple X across the head. So somewhere around the back of the top of the pec fin. And all that's gonna do is close up the rest of the wedge on the top of the mullet. So we'll do a cross right there and go back through the wire. And then again, just a simple double hand, overhand knot. Twice. And then that way everything's closed up tight. You slide the Hawaiian eye on there, it'll last forever. And pull it naked or with a or, islander, yeah, right? Or an islander, yep. Fast as you can to keep it in the water, right? I mean, yeah. really? Realistically. 1400 on your boat, 1400 RPMs, 1500. You don't have to. You can. 
I mean, that's probably a nice planer. Well, I, I think the, the, the common theme in pulling a mullet is you put it on a downrigger or a planer or something yeah. along those lines, you know. Mm -hmm. same, same goes for a mackerel. Sa same, same thing, you know. And you can, put, you can pull that thing naked or you can, a lot of times the lure, when you're trying to go as fast as you can, the lure will protect the bait a little bit so it lasts longer. But, uh, Would you cut that mullet with a damn laser? That thing's about 150 <laughs> I've cut a lot of them. <laughs> Only 150,000. Yeah. That, that's, 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 that's why you can buy them that way. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it, these, are, these are silver mullet and not black mullet like mostly we have around here. And a, a silver mullet is far more preferred because he's more, uh, I guess you'd call him more aerodynamic. He's and shinier. Yeah, shinier and more, the, the, the black mullet have a big blunt face on, they're really hard to make swim. These silver mullet are, are a lot easier to, 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 to get to swim. Correct. So we'll do a uh, Spanish mackerel next. This, I, we sell these two and they're brine and they, you know, usually you're seeing a Spanish mackerel that's usually fat. This thing is brine through the process and makes it skinny and swims great. And um, I can, I usually don't, but yes, in this application we will. Um, so they have a small cut in their, in their belly already, but for doing a double hook rig here, we're gonna open it up a little bit more just so we can get the second hook back further and it makes it easier to rig the front hook as well. So I'm just going to open it up. Now you should set back up. Yes. Yep. You got to do it. You got to open it up enough where you can slide the hooks in there. He's basically filleting this. This. Yeah. The, so just open it up as much as we can, and probably you, I'm sure you're going to have to adjust it some, to depending on the size of the hook or size of whatever it may be. Take a 9-0, uh, 10-0, depending on the size of the mackerel. We're going to do two hooks, so we're going to get one as far back as we can without inhibiting the swimming ability of it, I guess, you could say. So I'm going to use, uh, this is a 480 cable. I'm going to use this for the, for the back hook to make sure it gets back far enough. You guys asked if he sells these things rigged. I mentioned that to him and he said, man, they're gonna be kind of expensive. And I said, man, these guys pay 10, 12 bucks for a goggle eye. We throw them out every, every, every week. It's no problem, man. $125 high-speed lures. <clears throat> You can do it with wire too. I just, I don't know. I, I think cable's a little easier to work with for, for most people, I guess. Yeah. You have to use some you heavy know, wire, Scott, a little heavier wire, particularly between the hooks, and it'd be nearly impossible. You'd probably have to use, what, 15? Probably wire 15 between wire, the hooks. And, you know, it's not, definitely not the easiest thing to yeah, twist. So I'm going to take and slide a swivel on the front end of that for the second hook. So the idea is here is we're going to slide that to get it in the gills of the mackerel. We make it the right length. You're just getting the eye of the lead in the gill plane. No. Yes. So the so the for the second hook 
we're going to use the swivel is going to be the connection for the when I run the cable down through the top of the mackerel. So the swivel, you want the swivel and the gill plate, and then you want to run the sec, you know, the, the front hook. And you're going to do the eye of the hook right there. So you're going to run, make sure when you go down through the macro, you're going to get both the eye of the front hook and the swivel for the back hook. So I, I, I'd like to do it just in front of the eyes. Make, you know, take your needle and run it down through just to make it easier for you shoving the cable through it. You know, sometimes it doesn't hurt to wiggle it around a little bit more so that way you can have enough room to get the cable through. Slide your crimp on. Take your cable down through the top of the head. Again, it's important to make sure you hit the swivel and the hook, and the eye of the hook. And then we're just gonna we're gonna use an ounce and a half lead for this as well. If you were gonna if you were gonna rig that to swim, would you want a bigger lead or no? I would say it's gonna swim with an ounce and a half lead, no matter what, with a Hawaiian eye in front of it or not. And then same thing goes when you're like when you're. If you, you can do this with wire too. I just think it's a little easier rigging a mackerel with cable. Making sure you can get that lead as tight as possible to the chin of the mackerel. Sometimes using a bigger lead with a mackerel, it's tough to get it to lay right. And if it doesn't sit just right, you can always correct it with when we floss it. I would say somewhere around that, close as you can to that anal fin. Something, you know, somewhere in there. I think sometimes back here it might make it not do swim right or do anything, you know. I would say. The wahoo that's gonna eat that thing, hopefully he's big enough where he's gonna get that second hook regardless, but. Correct. And sometimes you get further back here, you know, that, the shank of that hook's, you know, damn near at the lateral line. So you get back here, it's, that hook might be out here at that point. Yeah, you can make this six, seven feet long as well. So we're going to take a piece of floss and close up the belly. Usually general, you know, if it's somewhere around arm length, it's enough floss to be able to do it. So we'll start with the belly. I like to go through the eyes first. And then you leave yourself a little bit of a tag here. So then we're going to start just working your way down the belly of the mackerel. His first stitch went through the gills. First stitch through the gills. The second one's about the, say, the pec fin. Correct. And then also, you don't want to do your, when you're flossing, you don't, you know, somewhere, not the lateral line, but not, the, not as close to the, where you cut the mackerel because it'll sometimes tear. So somewhere there's a happy median where you can you know, find the best, you know, far enough in, but not too close to where it doesn't rip. You don't want to go pulling on it and making bigger holes than what it already is. So, you're putting the needle below where the hook shank is. Um, this, the front, yes. This one will probably be above. You know, it's, I, try the ideally it would be to get the uh, needle above you, towards the belly more. So the shank of the hook would be down here. And you're gonna floss here, you know, above the hook shank. Mm -mm. Yep. Yep. 
So you don't want to you don't want to go too close together, creating more holes in the mackerel. So just you find out I don't know, say a half inch or an inch, whatever you know, depending upon the size of the mackerel. The back one, like the last one, would be definitely under you know under the shank of the hook. It wouldn't be above it. Go hind it one time. If I had scissors, I'd cut that. I ain't got scissors. That's one thing I forgot. And then when you go back, so we're back behind the hook. Then when you go back up to stitch it back up to the mouth, you want to hit each hole. Don't make separate holes. And just making an X all along the belly. And then when we get back up towards the, to the eyes here, we're going to take the tags, you know, pulling everything pretty tight. The idea is to close it all up pretty snug. Again, not too tight to where it's ripping the gill plates or anything like that. We're going to go through behind the lead here with both of them opposite ways. And then tie it tight with a double hand knot. Creating and trying to just make the lead stay in place as best you can. Then for the top of the mackerel. We'll go through the eyes. And what are you doing now for the top of the mackerel? Why, why are you doing this? Just so we can keep like the top of the cable snug to keep it as straight keep as possible. Straight, so it can't move. Right? So it can't move. So we'll go through the eyes, go through the cable. All you're trying to do there is to snug the cable back or wire, you know, whatever it may be. You just go, just make a couple stitches here. Two or three would be just fine for the, depending on the size. Correct. Just to try to keep everything as straight as possible. Also giving you a chance if you get a bite and miss him a little bit. Correct. Hold, help him hold on. Correct. Basically physically tying the mackerel to the cable too, you know, so. Yeah. So that way, if he does come in there and bite it, and he gets it, there might be something left. That's really it. important, like blue marlin fishing, when you pull them, a lot of times we'll pull a mackerel on the back of our chain, and a mullet on the back of our chain, is no matter what you have on the back of your chain, you wanna have that sucker tied on there. You wanna make it hard, so that fish comes, a billfish comes in there and whacks at it, and you can get it away. A lot of people pull a ballyhoo and just, just put a bait spring and a ballyhoo and a, Sailfish comes there and whacks at it, and he gets it, and the, the bait sinks, and he goes back and eats, and he's gone. He's gone. But if he, but if you, if if you, if you, if he whacks at it and it's tied on there, and he's going to get pissed, and he's going to get hungry, and and you got a lot better chance. But I yeah, say, it's the same idea with this. Yeah. The flossing might be a little bit much, but at least you know you when you put that thing out there, you're not going to worry about it coming apart or. 
The mullets and the mackerels are all brined. If you buy them from me, they're, they're going to be brined. The mullets are, or the, sorry, the ballyhoos are brined for a short period of time, but they're not going to be as tough as, say, this is. I mean, you could pull that thing all day. Yeah, that thing feels at like least. leather. I mean, it's at least. Um, so, I mean, it's, it doesn't hurt to thaw a ballyhoo out with a little salt in the water. I mean, it's not, I wouldn't say you have to. I would definitely use salt water. I wouldn't use fresh water to thaw them out or anything. Um, I wouldn't say you got to salt them or anything like that, though. It, probably, it wouldn't hurt if you did it with wahoo fishing, but like if you're trying to make a bait swim really well and you put a bunch of salt to it, it's not gonna. Did you ever dye any of your baits? We did that, uh, we used to do that years ago, but we, we don't. Uh, I think this is your dye right here, would be my opinion. Not to say it doesn't work, but I think it makes more of a mess than what it is worth on the boat, on the teak or. A lot of times we're dealing with teeth, so you do stuff like that, it makes a mess. Okay, um, so if anybody has any questions for the whole group and, and wants to ask him right now before we take a quick break, um, anybody got anything? He's going to spend plenty of time up here. He's got he's got a, a he's got a dozen he's got plenty of bait up here to show you guys. So if eight or ten of you want to come up here at a time, uh, that's great. Uh, one more thing before we go, Scott Stanley's right here. He's the, pre the new president of the Northeast Florida Marlin Association. Um, Scott and the Marlin Association and I kind of teamed up for this thing. And we have a lot of exciting things coming up in the future for the Marlin Club. We're excited about it. And we'd like to, to just ask all of you that aren't members, a lot of you are members, just to, to uh, keep your eye on social media, keep your eye on your email. Um, we've got some new things coming for 2022 that we're real excited about and we're going to try our best to get this place back to, uh, you know, it's, it's a great place, you know, and, we're, and everybody in here, we all share the same passion, the same light, the same love. So we should, we should, we should utilize this place and do things like this and get together. So you have anything to add to that? Okay, if anybody, we'll, we'll take a little break. There's lots of food back here in the back. So if you just walked in late, there's lots of food. And uh, we appreciate you guys coming, and Tyler will be up here for at least the next three hours. <laughs> <laughs>